Good morning. Welcome to Wyckoff Assembly of God, our international church, and we mean international. We're sharing with people around the world, and, and it's amazing, even locally, the people that I've, I've met and shared with even the last couple weeks that we're watching how God is touching lives inside of homes in so many ways. And I don't know what your need is today or what you've come to find out about Jesus, but I pray that God will help you grow deeper in Him during this broadcast today. That's our goal, is to grow, also to allow God to do miracles in your life, also allow God to just flow through you to other people. Those are some big, big thoughts there that we believe God is using you for. We're gonna be sharing in a few minutes in communion, and you might wanna get your communion ready, just get a piece of bread and, and juice, and we'll share together in just a few minutes the Lord's Supper. We also would like to encourage you, a part of worship is our giving unto God. And uh, our international church is, is one of our supporters here, big time supporters of, of, of taking care of this facility, this church, this entire building, and the outreach that we do. We thank you for being partners with us and sharing with us over and over again. We pray that God will bless you abundantly. You can give either online or you can give through the mail or you can just drop it by the church as some people do. May God bless you today and, and strengthen you. I just wanna pray for you. Lord, I just pray for our international church today. Lord, it is reaching around the globe. And Lord, I don't know what their needs are, but God, we ask that you will minister to them right now in Jesus' name. Strengthen them, guide them, direct them all the way through. Lord, fulfill the things inside of them, God, that you purposed in their life to be. Lord, as we come into worship, we share in communion all throughout this service, that God, you will do a great work inside of each person. Amen. God bless you. Join us now as we worship the living God. Amen. He's alive in the land this morning. He wants to fight your battle.
can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord It speaks 
Jesus, for there is power in the blood. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Because of Christ's shed blood, God is able to forgive us of sins because He took our punishment. And not only that, you know, we are saved from the wrath of God. And the blood of Jesus, it's not just the one-time thing. It's constantly, constantly forgiving us and constantly healing us. So, as we continue to worship Him, just think of the sacrifice that He has done on the cross. Jesus alone and that's because of his unconditional love for us hallelujah hallelujah Lord we just come to you we honor you we worship you with all of our hearts with all of our soul thank you Jesus we believe we believe in the power of the blood of the, your blood your shed blood Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. For those who are sick out there, we just, just tap on them, on Jesus. Just, just tap on the power. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, the blood, crimson love, lies of life's demand.
no greater love, grace how can it be? Death on the cross and all 
as we do it. We do it in remembrance of his work, but in anticipation of when we will be with him in heaven and sit around that table with him. That's why we remember what he did, the sacrifice, a great price that none of us could pay. The debt was insurmountable. We had been kidnapped by sin. And the ransom was only the shedding of blood. And that blood was the blood of Jesus Christ. He saved our lives. I hope you, I know you're getting it, but are you getting it that he saved our life? We want to be here today to even celebrate or commemorate this. If he had to shed his blood for us, for our redemption. He is worthy of all of our praise and adoration. He is worthy of it all. represents your body. And that, Lord, whatever you made provision for, it is ours today. Lord, if there's one here that needs healing, I pray that as they eat this bread, they would receive healing. For the one that, that's even watching, Lord, online, as they take an element that they've prepared, as they eat it, may they receive healing. May it just be poured over their body right now in Jesus' name. Because that's one of the provisions of your body being beaten and broken on the cross was for us to have healing and restoration and wholeness, restore and bring wholeness, I pray, to the one that might need it today. In Jesus' name, let us eat. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we receive your healing today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Scripture also teaches us that he took the cup, which represents his blood that was shed for us. Jesus. Scripture teaches us also that without the shedding of blood, there is no, there is no redemptive power whatsoever. Thank you, Jesus. you can't Jesus. get cleansed without the blood of Jesus. You can't get forgiven of all your sins without the blood of Jesus. It had to be the blood of Jesus. 
the lamb that was sacrificed. Old Testament, it was a covering. They'd sacrifice a lamb, and it would just literally cover the sins. But the New Testament moves into the fact that God had a perfect plan all the way through, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. And as he died on the cross for you, it's for your forgiveness of sin today. And that forgiveness of sin is noted in this blood today. And as we take this cup, Lord Jesus, we thank you for shedding your blood on the cross for us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you had a plan all along, all the way through. We ask now that you will literally take care of those things inside of us that have been haunting us day and night. Lord, there's some memories that people have been dealing with. I don't know what it's all about, but there's some memories that people have been dealing with about some things of times past. Lord, it's your blood that covers even those memories, that covers even those memories. Wash those memories now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's take a drink in remembrance of him.
hard to believe last Sunday we celebrated the resurrection, isn't it? Amen. This week we're sharing communion, remembering yes. what he did when he went to the cross. Yes. But we also remember this until the day he comes back again. Yes. Until the day he comes back again, what scripture teaches us. Now, I, I know there's a lot of things floating around on, on the internet about the eclipse and so many other things that are going on and Statue of Liberty getting struck by lightning and and I've heard it all. By the way, the Statue of Liberty gets struck 600 times a year. Just information's sake. The eclipse has been going on since the beginning of time. God designed it that way. Somebody said, what about the scriptures to talk about the blood moon and all those things? Well, let me tell you. If you wake up in the morning, not tomorrow, but wake up in the morning, and things are different for the first time, without the news broadcasters saying so, then you know it's a supernatural thing that God is doing. Come on now. Then you know it's a supernatural thing. You can't take what scientists have already predicted and say that's what God is doing. You need to take what God, because God doesn't follow science. He created science. Come on. What he creates, he doesn't follow. He creates. That's who God is. So as you get up tomorrow and you celebrate the, the, the beautiful day and then all of a sudden the sun comes over and it gets dark and just celebrate that God had a perfect plan for this earth. He still has a perfect plan for you and me. And I don't know when he's coming back, but I, I, I'm getting ready. There's an old song we used to sing and some people said, well, that's not quite theologically correct. Someday I'm going to fly away. <laughs> Someday I'm going to fly away, so I'm just getting my wings ready. I'm just getting things ready because I want to see Jesus face to face. I can't wait to see Jesus face to face. Come on now. That's what I look forward to is seeing Jesus face to face. He's the author and the finisher of our faith, and he's the one that I'm looking forward to. And I can't wait to see Jesus face to face. We have a uh, missionary associate, Markella Quinn, if you'll come up. She is going to the Ivory Coast, and she can give you more information about that, but we welcome her, her here today. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Russ. Thank you so much for having me. Wyckoff AG, thank you so much for welcoming me, welcoming me into your home, to your church. Um, wow, what a beautiful time we had in worship. I was, um, wow, so humbled that he is so worthy and I'm so unworthy like I'm so unworthy but he makes me worthy like he he redeems me and he restores me into right relationship with him so I'm so grateful um, I was reminded during that last song you're worthy of it all um, of of the Moravian movement um, the Moravians are a group of Christians hundreds of years ago and, and they sent the story goes, they sent a group of missionaries out to foreign countries to tell others about Jesus. And, and the story goes, as the families would send out their loved ones off on the ships, sailing off to distant lands, maybe to never see them again, the families would cry out from the shores and say, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive the reward of his suffering. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive the reward of his suffering. And so that just touches me as I head off to my foreign missions field, that I'm doing it because he's worthy, not because Mark Quinn is anything, but because he is everything. And he's worthy of not only my going, but can I challenge you, church, to ask God what he might have you do for the lost around the world, because he's worthy to receive the reward of his suffering. So my name is Markella Quinn. I am a missionary associate to the country of Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, West Africa. Um, I want to show you guys um, a little bit about what I was able to do out in Ivory Coast when I was there last year. I also want to tell you a little bit about myself, how I was called in my testimony. Um, so I grew up in a church about 30 minutes away from here, um, Calvary Assembly of God in Springfield, New Jersey. I started going to church when I was six years old, um, and ever since then I've been going to that same church. 
Um, so I grew up in church. I grew up going to kids' church and participating in BGMC. I grew up going to my church's youth group and, and participating in Speed the Light. Um, but throughout my years growing up in church, um, there came a point where I just started to play church. And I, I never had a real relationship with God. I would go to church every Wednesday and Friday and Sunday. Every week I would go and be faithful, but I never had a true relationship with Jesus. And so when I was 18 years old, when I first started college, I finally decided no more playing games. I'm finally going to make my relationship with Jesus authentic and real. I'm tired of being two-faced. And I started getting serious with God. And so when I was 19, I was a sophomore in college. I went to Seton Hall University in South Orange. I majored in anthropology. And so with anthropology, I focused mainly on cultural anthropology, which talks about culture, what culture is, what consists of a culture, what makes up a culture, how do cultures around the world vary and grow. And so with that major, I thought I would go into museum professions, either work in a museum, as a curator, as a researcher, or educator. Um, and so that was my track. That was like my long-term vision and goal for my future. But I remember it was a Sunday afternoon after church, and I was praying at the altar after service. And I asked the Lord what he wanted me to do with the rest of my life. Like, what did he want me to do after I graduate college? And so I put before the Lord two options. Either, Lord, is it museum professions or is it missions? Because again, I grew up in church and we were a missions-minded church. We still are. And so participating in BGMC and Speed the Light and and some days we would have missionaries come and speak during church service. And so I was always exposed to missions growing up. And so in the back of my mind and deep in my heart, I always knew that missions was something I could go into. So that Sunday afternoon, I asked the Lord, Lord, do you want me to do museum professions or missions? And I put those two options before him. And I just heard him say so gently and softly, missions. And I took that word away in my heart. And uh, flash forward a couple months later, um, that was November of 2019 that I prayed that prayer and I heard God call me to missions. Um, but a couple months later, it's March 2020, and this thing called COVID-19 happens. And the pandemic comes and shuts everything down. My college classes get moved online, church gets moved online, we can't meet in person. And we pretty much have to stay in our homes because of quarantine. How many of you guys remember that, those times? And so here I was feeling called to missions, and yet everything around me seemed so opposite to what God had called me to. I thought to myself, Lord, how can I go into missions? How can I pursue what you've called me to when I can't even leave my home, when I can't even go to class or church? But God was faithful to remind me and encourage me that his word for me was wait. During my devotions in the morning, in the, in the Bible stories I read, in the songs that I listened to, God would always say, wait. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. And so I knew that my calling to missions wasn't canceled, but just put on pause. And so... A couple months later, um, so I'm currently a youth group leader at my church's youth group. Um, and so during the pandemic, all of us youth leaders would meet online for a weekly Zoom meeting. Our youth pastor, Justin, would come online and share a quick devotional. We'd pray together at the end, and then that would be it. And so it was during one of these weekly Zoom meetings during the summer um, that Justin had shared his devotional. We were all praying, our heads were bowed, our eyes were closed, and out of nowhere, our youth pastor says, I feel like God is saying one of you is called into missions. And so I did one of those things where I, my head was bowed, my eyes were closed, but I peeked up, I looked at the screen to see if any other youth leader was reacting to this. And no one else was. Everyone was like, heads bowed, eyes closed. And so I thought to myself, well, maybe he means another youth leader. At that point, I had not told anyone else that I felt called to missions. Probably only my mom and my brother and my dad, and that's it. And so next week rolls around and it's the same Zoom meeting and I hop on the call and at that point it's only me and Justin in the chat room. 
And so we get to small talk, and, and Justin eventually asks, you know, um, so Markel, what, what do you want to do after college? Like, what are your plans? And so I said, well, it's interesting that you ask me that because I actually feel like God's calling me to missions. And then he says to me, well, that's interesting because the person that I felt God had said was called to missions was you. And so God just confirmed again and again and again that I am called and that his plan for my life wasn't canceled just because of outward circumstances. And I just want to use that to encourage any of you guys here today or watching online if you feel like God's put something on your heart, but yet the circumstances around you say otherwise, hold on to that word from God. If he's called you to something, he will make ways and he will open the doors in his perfect timing. And so back in 2023, God opened the door for me to go on my first mission trip to Ivory Coast. And so I have a couple pictures you guys can see on the screen if we go to that next one. I want to show you guys a couple of things that me and the other missionaries out in Cote d'Ivoire were able to do um, during our time there. I was able to go last year um, in the month of February. I stayed there the whole month, and I worked with another Assemblies of God missions team out there on the field. If you look on your left, one of the things we were able to do was go into a local public school and hand out what's called the Book of Life. Essentially what it is, it's an evangelism resource material that puts the message of the gospel in a kid-friendly format. And we went in and handed out these books of life to different classrooms, to different students, and as you can see, they were so happy and excited to receive them. Another thing that we were able to do out in Cote d'Ivoire was a Bible club. So some of the missionaries out there had started a weekly Bible club that would meet on sun Saturday mornings. And what these missionaries would do is we would go around the village knocking on kids' doors, asking them if they wanted to join us for our Bible club. And essentially what it was was a very basic Sunday school class. We would have songs and dance and worship. We would play a game. And then afterwards, one of the missionaries would share a very simple Bible story, Bible lesson. And so that was one of the things we were able to do out there. If we go to that next slide, we were also able to build what's called tabernacles out there in Ivory Coast. Um, so many churches in Ivory Coast and throughout Africa um, have very limited uh, church structures or, or facilitated buildings that they can meet in. And so if you look on that picture up on the screen, on the bottom right was the old church that the congregation would meet in. And it's literally wooden planks, banana leaves, tarps, and concrete bricks. Like, that was their church that they would meet in. No floor, it would just be a dirt floor. Um, and so as you can see, that's a very basic, very limited church structure that a church congregation would meet in. And so what we were able to do is go in and build what's called a tabernacle. It's that structure over there in the middle. And so we set up and went to different villages and built those tabernacles to, facil to have churches facilitate their church congregation with a better church structure. And so what the church would do then is go in and build the walls and the floor and put the windows in and the doors, et cetera, et cetera. And so now the church is going to meet in that main building while the kids' church is going to meet in the building to your lower right. And so I would have to say that out of my whole time doing ministry at Ivory Coast last year, Tabernacle Building was one of the hardest and challenging things um, during that week, we were building tabernacles. Out there, it's hot. It's like 90 to 100 degrees. And so we were out there doing manual labor, putting up these structures. Um, that week, I had gotten sick. I had eaten something that just was not settling in my stomach right. And so we were hot. We were sweaty. We were tired. I was sick. I was not feeling well. Um, but I remember coming back to the place we were staying after building one of these tabernacles and feeling just so tired and just hot and, and sick and, and thinking to myself, in spite of all the challenges and difficulties that we faced building those tabernacles, I remember thinking that I could be doing this for the rest of my life and I would be so happy and so content. And so while I was out there, God just confirmed to me again that missions, yes, is what he's called me to. And it's going to be a lifelong thing for me as, as long as I'm able, as long as he allows me to. 
Um, I want to show you guys a little bit more about the country of Ivory Coast. If you go to the next slide, there it is on the map. It's located in West Africa, sandwiched between Ghana and Liberia. The main language they speak in Ivory Coast is French. They used to be a French colony. Um, as you can see, that's the map over there to your left. If we go to the next slide, just to give you guys some numbers and statistics, 60% um, of the country of Ivory Coast consists of kids, teens, and young adults. 60% of the country is 25 and under. So that means the biggest age demographic in the country is kids, teens, and young adults. 43% of the country is Muslim. Islam is the predominant religion in Ivory Coast. And so you take those two statistics, those two facts, and if we can go to that next slide, there's a huge need in Ivory Coast because many churches in Ivory Coast either don't have a kids or teen ministry or the one that they do have is either um, not well equipped or well resourced or well staffed. Um, and so there's a huge gap, a huge disparity between the biggest age group in Ivory Coast, kids and teens, and the ability of churches to meet the spiritual needs of the biggest age population they have. And so my goal in Ivory Coast is to see a healthy church within walking distance of every kid and every teen in Ivory Coast. A healthy kid and teen-friendly church. So that's my goal while I'm out there. Um, so if we can go to that next slide. My goal is to be out in Ivory Coast, hopefully earliest is August of this year. Um, however, I can't get out there until I re reach 100% of my budget. Um, praise the Lord that I'm 100% funded with my cash budget, but I'm only 27% with my monthly commitments. And so if what I've said this morning resonates with you, and if you want to partner with me to see a healthy kid and teen friendly church within walking distance of every child and teen in Africa, um, would you talk to Pastor Wes and see if there's any way that you guys can support me monthly on a giving basis? And so that's all I have to say. Thank you, Pastor Wes, and thank you, Church, for, for having me and listening to this sermon. Let me, let me just uh, let me ask you a question. Our kids are really into BGMC. You see the bucket here. Yeah. It's not unusual for them just to bring something. In fact, does anybody have BGMC money yes. today? I see this coming. Oh, We're coming right now. Come on. That makes you guys me are so coming. happy. Oh, here we go. Jesus. They do this almost every week. It's supposed to be once a month, but they're doing it just about every week. Praise the Lord. She's a little Praise God. No, she's going to get it. Pastor Becky now. Can you tell me? Yeah. Have you seen? BGMC money used over there. Have you seen that? Yeah. So um, in our Ivory Coast team, we have like puppets that we do. So actually, when we went out to build the tabernacles, we would build the tabernacles and then host the kids program. So it was a lot in one day. But we had puppets that we would use to entertain the kids and to do our worship and songs with. And so BGMC money, what you guys are doing every week, every month, giving is helping resource missionaries all around the world with puppets or with evangelism materials or with sound systems, whatever it is. So yeah, definitely. Awesome. BGMC awesome. money is being put to use. Father, we have heard her heart. And that is a heart that you have given her for the people and the children and the teens in Ivory Coast. So with that, we know, Lord, that you have solidified it in her so when the time gets tough, she has that to stand on that you said this is what she's to do. So I thank you, Lord, you will increase her stamina to stand firm and not waver in that. But Lord, I also pray that you would empower her and equip her with every good gift that she needs even to raise the rest of that money. Lord, you begin to wake up people in the night. You put her name, you put her face before them. Maybe they never even heard of her, but it would be that they would give money to get her there faster than August. And Lord, I thank you that you will also prepare the way as she goes, that you will order her steps, you will uphold her, preserve her, and sustain her, and that an anointing that breaks yokes would be upon her like she has never known before, and she would just walk in that every day, even here before she goes, but even as she travels, Lord, let every visa 
Let every piece of document go through without any uh, hiccups or any kind of uh, a turn down or whatever, Lord God. You open every door for her and she will walk through it, Lord, with the boldness, the boldness of your anointing upon her life. And I thank you that we will hear of harvests that have been reaped and churches that have uh, prolific, prolific ministry, the teens and children in their neighborhood, Lord God, like never before, because you equipped her to go, you empowered her to be there, and you increased her stamina to stay, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning. Good morning. You sound like you were asleep. Good morning. Good morning. Very good. Okay, I'm going to read from Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse 9, where it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. God loves a cheerful giver. And when we give to him, he gives us what we need. Not always what we want, but what we really need. And we thank God for that. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you, Lord God that we're able to give into the kingdom of God. We just pray, Lord God, that as we give, Father God, that you will multiply those giving, Father God, so that it will reach the ends of the world, Lord God, especially those countries and places that do not know you, that do not know who you are, that they will come to know you, Father God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. I want to share with you today about believe. And we've been talking about on the road to Pentecost. I know we talked about on the road to the cross, miracles on the road to the cross before. Last week we started with on the road to Pentecost. Uh, you know, we talked last week about Peter's restoration on the road to Pentecost. And it's, it basically is not just his restoration, but turns around to reaching the lost, which was probably one of the biggest themes that we find on the day of Pentecost, reaching the lost. Uh, today, <clears throat> let's look at believe which is also a theme on the day of Pentecost. And we, we find this in several things. And, we, and probably one of the most incredible stories there is the one that we uh, just nail, a guy by the name of Thomas. Uh, we, <laughs> we nail him to the wall about his doubting. We call him Doubting Thomas and all sorts of stuff that way. But I want to deal and dig into that because I think there's some Thomas in a lot of people. A lot of people, that's right. See, belief is not human-based, but God-based. Belief is one of those things that, that God shares the story to us, and he shares this love to us, and shares this thought to us. And he, as he shares that to us, he wants us to simply believe in him. So it's not a human thought that just comes out and pops out of our head and says, okay, that's, that's cool, I'm going to believe that. No, it's deeper than that. It's based on scripture. It's based on Almighty God. And so... The story of Lazarus, uh, which we talked about a few weeks ago, uh, who had become seriously ill. Mary and Martha had sent word uh, to Jesus to come and heal his friend, and Jesus says his sickness will not end in death, so he stayed two more days. And while this two days is going on, there's some distraught going on with uh, Mary and Martha because they believe he's dead. And we jump over to John, the 11th chapter, verse 7, it says this, Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Let's go back to Judea. Now, if you read the passage previous to that, it was in Judea that they actually tried to, to kill Jesus and disciples, and they were out to just destroy them and get rid of them at that point in time. So we find this, this dialect that comes out of Thomas at the time, and uh, his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? And Jesus said, Lazarus is sleeping, and so his disciples thought that he was sleeping, he would get better, not understanding that he was dead at that point in time. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now you will really believe. He builds on this whole premise of believing. Come, let us go see him. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, or Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. Now, Thomas has a, is a guy who doesn't quite get the whole picture of what Jesus is saying there. But 
He's strong in his belief that we need to go with Jesus and die there because he's looking at the situation and it's the things that he saw that he believes are real. And what he saw before was a crowd that tried to kill Jesus. And so that's what he's believing in. And that's what he's focused on. He's focused on that. He's not even focused on the, the healing of Lazarus. He's focused on we're going to go there and die because these people are going to kill us as we go there. Now, Jesus was focused on healing, Lazarus living. Thomas was focused on dying. His, his comment seems to reveal excessive uh, pessimis, pessimism. He could see nothing but disaster ahead. and uh, he, he literally could only see one direction, and that's all he could see. Uh, this doesn't show that Thomas... Uh, was lacking in, in courage. In fact, he was very courageous because he says this, let's go there and die. Simple as that, let's go there and die. Uh, he was willing to lay down his life. He was willing to, to literally lay down his life. But that's not what Jesus was trying to help them understand. The second thought that we find on Thomas and in the book of John is uh, Thomas uh, misses the plan. That's what I call it. This is the plan. Over in John, the 14th chapter, verse 1, uh, Thomas couldn't grasp what Jesus wanted to do for him. He missed what Jesus wanted to do for him. He missed that whole thought about what Jesus really, really wanted to do. Again, Jesus sought to assure his disciples of eternal life, and the spirit of Thomas was revealed. That's what takes place here. In John, the 14th chapter, verse 1, says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and, and some versions say rooms. I'm not going to go in that explanation at this point in time. Uh, if it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and where you know the way to where I am going. And now Thomas kicks in here. It's probably the, the, the most quoted that I have done and oftentimes, and Thomas kicks in there. He's one of these guys that go, wait, wait a minute, i got to have some thought on this thing. Uh, you know, Jesus, um, you didn't quite make that clear enough to all of us, is what he's saying. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. In fact, Jesus, you didn't supply a GPS for us at this time. You didn't even provide for us an old road map. So how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, in the most powerful statement that I, I've always trumped on over and over again, and is, that is this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except, except by me. And if you know me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, from now on, you do not know him and have seen him. In other words, you haven't, you haven't seen him, but yet you know him. And you, you haven't quite put all this picture together. You haven't quite put it all together. God's plan is very simple. He waits for us to accept it. Simple as that. Uh, getting past the doubts, well, that's what Thomas had a hard struggle doing. Thomas struggled to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Literally struggled to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. He must have seen the nails in his hands and the spear and, and thrust to the side. And, and uh, he, he's literally struggling at this moment in time. And uh, he's struggling with this whole thought that Jesus really was alive. What he sees is what he believes in. Back to that story I just read you a minute ago that, that you know, they're, they're there and Jesus is predicting his death. He's predicting the future. He's predicting all those things. And all Thomas can see at that point in time, all that Thomas can see is his Lord, I don't, I don't get the roadmap. I don't, I don't get the plan. I don't, I don't get what's really supposed to be taking place here. I really don't understand all of that. And this doesn't totally make sense to me. Can you make it a little clearer, Lord? And when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, it's, it's so clear. So clear. He is your way. He is your truth. He is your life. And, and nobody comes to the Father except through the Son. And, and Jesus died on the cross for you. And that's, that's really what he's preparing them for. He's trying to get, get them past the doubts. He's trying to get them past all the stuff. And, and getting, getting Thomas past the doubts is a struggle. It totally is a struggle at this point in time. You know, Thomas missed the plan. 
So now he's got to get past the doubts. He missed the plan, so he has to get past the doubts. Uh, getting past the doubts is an incredible task. Thomas struggled to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. You know, I, I wonder if he, he literally watched, and we don't have all the details of <coughs> Jesus, if, if, when Jesus died on the cross, if Thomas was there, but it seemed to be several of the disciples were there. But somehow he had seen the, the, the nail-scarred hands. He had seen where the nails went through his hands. And he had also see, seen where his side was pierced because Thomas says this, uh, <coughs> he, he really is struggling with this whole thing. And he says this because the disciples are trying to convince Thomas but Thomas, you know, Jesus is alive. In chapter 20, uh, verse 24, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. In other words, Jesus had come and revealed himself to several of them, and, and they all had, had seen Jesus. And Thomas is, Thomas is going, oh, no, no, that's not going to work for me. Uh, I've got to have a little more proof than that. I've got to understand this a little more. And he struggled literally with his memory at this time because he still sees that, that, that nail-scarred hands. He still sees that pierced side. He still sees Jesus hanging on that cross. He still sees all those things. But he ha doesn't have this memory healing that needs to take place. Uh, Jesus answers Thomas' request. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Uh, I jumped ahead. Sorry about that. Verse 24 it says, Now Thomas, one of the disciples called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark uh, uh, into his into the mark of his of uh, mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And all the, although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be unto you. Now, isn't it enough? Just think about this for a moment. Isn't it enough that the doors were locked and Jesus comes through locked doors? Some people would say, well, that's all I need, man. Man, I can believe right there. Woo! That's just, Jesus, do that for me. But... It wasn't enough for Thomas. And I challenge you, if that's what you're waiting on, you will also struggle with believing in Jesus because he wants us to believe in him regardless of what we have seen, regardless of what we're, we think we have seen, regardless of the memories, regardless of all those other things. Move past the stuff and simply believe in Jesus Christ. It was Jesus who walked through the locked door, and Jesus answers Thomas' request, and he says this to Thomas. Thomas, he said to Thomas, put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. So, all the doubts need to go, all the doubts need to move aside. For the day of Pentecost, moving ahead, they had to believe so he's setting Thomas up for that day of Pentecost. He's setting Thomas up for the future. He's setting Thomas up so that he'll believe at that point in time. The psalmist cried out in, in Psalm 13, verse 1, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And probably, probably Thomas is feeling that thought. You know, you know God's not hearing me. He's not, he's not understanding me because... I haven't really had this, this answer. Now, all of a sudden, he's got this answer of putting his fingers and his hand on the places where Jesus hung on the cross and where he was killed. Thomas wanted to believe. That's right. He wanted to believe. There's a difference between honest and dishonest doubters. Some people just don't want to believe. I'm not going to believe. I'm not. You know, I, I've heard about that stuff all my life, and I'm just not going to believe it. But there's, there's something about an honest unbeliever, an honest person that, that comes, and, uh, comes and says, you know, I just, I just want to believe, but I, I have a struggle. You know, the dishonest people, they make up the excuses and they blame others and cover their own dishonesty. And they, they make all sorts of reasons why they can't do this. Thomas isn't doing that. He says, I just want to, I just want to touch him. I just want to see Jesus. I just want to touch him. Thomas was and had been following Jesus, and Thomas really wanted to believe. 
I just want to see him. You know, there's, there's a song that uh, I remember talking about it, uh, sharing with somebody uh, who had lost somebody recently. It's called We Shall Behold Him. This, this beholding Jesus is an incredible task. But to begin to get to that point, God just simply wants us to believe now. I need to behold Jesus, but I need to start with just believing who Jesus is. Thomas really wanted to believe. Jesus works us through our doubts. Uh, Jesus blames no one for wanting to be sure. Jesus did not condemn Thomas for his doubts. Didn't condemn him. Didn't say, yo, get out of here. You know, you're not going to make it. You, Thomas, we've, we've worked so hard with you. been three and a half years now. We've worked so hard with you. You're just not going to make it, Thomas. He didn't do that. Thomas had fought his way through the wilderness of his doubts and struggled with all those things. And, and now Jesus was trying to reaffirm in Thomas's life. Jesus never says you'll never have doubts, but rather you must struggle with your doubts until you reach the certainty. Verse 27 says, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. He takes him and reaffirms, reaffirms inside of Thomas, reaffirms him. You know, uh, this, re this reaffirming in somebody's life is what Jesus did in my life. He brought that, that time when I, when I wasn't quite lining up to where God wanted me to be. I wasn't quite lining up to all those things. And maybe I had my doubts. Maybe I was just lost in the pain of some things I'd gone through. Maybe I was just lost in some other stuff. And, and I was struggling with the doubts. Well, it's moving past those doubts that God begins to bring some things into our lives. And he may bring something to your life to help you move past the doubts. You know, early in the ministry, Jesus had taught Thomas and the rest of the disciples about faith many times, many times. There's a story in Mark, the ninth chapter, verse 14 through 29. It says this, And when they, had, when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately the, all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you. For he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whatever it seizes him, it throws him down. And he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when he, the spirit saw him, immediately convulsed the boy and he fell to the ground and rolled around and foamed at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for the one who believes immediately. The father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Jesus was teaching Thomas at that time. Do you know that? He's teaching all his disciples. This unbelief Help my unbelief. Thomas was struggling at this point in time just to believe that Jesus was alive. Thomas had gone through the teachings. He'd gone and viewed the miracles. He'd gone through all those things and watched over and over again. Yet, Coming back to life, that the memory, the, the picture, the, the, the situation he saw was so vivid in his mind that he could not move past that. Now the God of the universe who had cooked breakfast on the beach for Peter was ready to have a close encounter with Thomas. Close encounter with Thomas, who had struggled with Jesus' death. The most noted doubter declared his faith. The most noted doubter who had struggled so hard was was now having this close encounter encounter what how do you know his close encounter he said put your hand into my palm of my hands where that nail used to be put it there 
and, and, and take, take your hand and put it on my side. Put it on my side. Thomas, do that. Do that because I want to have this encounter with you. And, and the one who was dead is now alive. And the one who, who they thought had been crucified. One Thomas, you thought that you saw this and this is all that could ever be. It is much greater than that. Thomas, there's more to this than what you think it is. Now, Thomas' faith grows through the struggle of this encounter with Jesus Christ. No man would be willing to die unless he knew he had the truth. They would not have died for a dream. They would not have been loyal to a figment of imagination. This encounter with Thomas would last a long time to come. There's some history books that teach us that Thomas was uh, literally a missionary to India after that. We don't have it in scripture, but we have some history books that, that, that share with those thoughts and share with those things. And Thomas literally emerged victorious at that point in time. We don't find that Thomas ran off not believing. We don't find that Thomas ran off like Judas or anybody else. But this, this, this thing in Thomas's life began to subside and began to change and began to, to move around. He wanted to be with Jesus. He wanted to have this, this, this thought of being with Jesus. He had been with Jesus three and a half years. And now he had shared earlier in, in John, the 14th chapter, you know, we'll go with you to die. Actually, John 11, go with you to die. And then he struggles with this, where are you going, Jesus? Because I want to make sure I'm there with you. He wants to know that. He wants the GPS uh, markings. He wants, he wants the, the map markings. He wants all the details. But yeah, he can't quite bring it to his brain all those things that's taking place. And now he's, he's, he's faced to face with Jesus as Jesus has walked through closed doors. There's some closed doors in your life that Jesus has walked through. He's tried to share his love with you. He's tried to share other things with you. He's tried to help you through this time and this struggle. Maybe you're struggling with, I don't want to just hear he's alive, but I want him to, I want to connect with him today. I want to somehow connect with this Jesus who is this incredible God. I don't know what your position is at this point in time. But I want to have an encounter with Jesus. And you might be struggling with believing in him. And he wants to have an encounter with you. If he takes time to solidify Thomas, even though he'd spent much time with him, he'd worked with Thomas on faith, he'd worked with Thomas on all sorts of things, and he still was struggling and wasn't quite lining up, he's that kind of God who wants to take some time with you. He's that kind of God that makes sure Peter's okay. He's that kind of God that wants to make sure things are okay in your life. He, he, wants to, he wants to work those things inside of your life right now. That's what he wants to do. You might say, you know, I'm, I'm doubting some things because of some situations. And you may have had some things that, that are very, 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 very vivid in your life. And, and you look at those things and you go, yeah, I, I remember this very clearly. And, and I remember this and this and this over here. Why did this have to take place? And you have several questions, but move past the questions and have that encounter. Move past the questions because the encounter will eventually answer the questions. The encounter helped Thomas know the way, the truth, and the life. Because Jesus is your way, the truth, and the life. You say, how do I begin that? You simply say, Jesus Christ. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I ask you to wash me white as snow. I want, to, I want to follow after you. I don't want to doubt anymore. I want to throw away the doubts. I want to believe in you. So why don't you start doing that today? Begin to believe in Jesus because he is the way, the truth, and the life in your life. Lord, I ask right now that there's somebody watching here that is struggling greatly inside and doesn't know you as a personal savior. So Lord, begin to solidify those things in their life. Maybe there's some things, there's some memories they've got that just can't get past. Maybe there's some situations they have struggled with for a long time and they're really struggling with them now. Help them, Lord Jesus, on all those situations. 
Lord, if they're asking you to come into their heart and life, help them to literally begin to grow in you and follow after you, Lord. Lord, I pray for them right now as they say, Dear Jesus, come into my heart and life. Forgive me of all my sins. I ask you to cleanse me inside, Lord Jesus. I want to follow after you. Lord, help them to do that. person that's had doubts come in, Lord, even if they've been a Christian for a while, Lord, help those doubts just to disappear as your love and they encounter you even more comes into their life and just flushes that stuff out. In Jesus' name I pray. I bring the peace, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, my friends. He is alive. He is alive. And whether you're going through the doubting or whether you've done some things you struggle with, just know this. He's alive for you today. He died on the cross, but he rose again just for you. God bless you.